Hello and welcome to lesson 37, particle physics. All right, first little quote here. The stumbling way in which even the ablest of the scientists in every generation have had to fight through thickets of erroneous observations, misleading generalizations, inadequate formulations, and unconscious prejudice is rarely appreciated by those who obtain their scientific knowledge from textbooks. All right, because really what they're getting at there is often we look at science as just being this collection of facts, right? But it's really a way of thinking, right? The, the, the hard work that these people have had to do, you can imagine everybody coming up with their own idea and trying to sort through those ideas. All right, so I'll let you guys, again, <clears throat> read through in parts here and there. But we're getting into, um, yeah, particle physics. So the first part of this is particle detectors. So how do we actually see these things? So they're extremely small, right? So like we're, we're not going to see these things they're way too small they're moving way too quickly um yeah like you'd have to see on uh, like on that kind of an order right 10 to the negative 22 or 10 to the 9 seconds um so in order to detect them we have to have it interact with something that we can see so the first way that we're going to do this is by something called a cloud chamber so the way that the cloud chamber works is we get this gas and the gas has to be what's called super saturated. So it's really just at the point, like it's, it's a vapor, but there's like a lot of, of vapor in there and it's just about to turn into a liquid, right? So you got vapor particles everywhere, like it's a gas and it's just about to turn into um, to a liquid, right? And what's gonna happen is that when we send this particle through here, it's going to leave a trail behind it. Actually, really, it's going to be the same way that um, planes like va leave uh, vapor trails. Have you ever looked up in the sky and seen that, right? That's what that is. They're actually condensing the gas in behind the plane um, and, and leaving like a trail of, of, of bubbles be or of, yeah, clouds behind, right? That's why it's called a cloud chamber. It's sort of like leaving like a little tra uh, trail of clouds behind it. But for this one to work, that's what you need is a super saturated gas. And then you got your particle that's going to come through and then leave like a condensed um, water droplets in behind it where it turns into more of a liquid in behind it, right? All right, the next one, it's called a bubble chamber. So in a bubble chamber, what's happening is we get different types of, of material like uh, propane or hydrogen or helium um, and put it under incredible pressure right and when it gets down to that pressure the the hydrogen actually it, it has to be kept below negative 252.8 degrees celsius right remembering that absolute zero is negative 270 so you're you're getting pretty much almost as cold as you can be like we're pretty close at that point right um then what happens is if you like let the pressure off right so you've got this chamber and then we just let the pressure off right so just Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> You're letting the pressure off there. What happens is that it'll start to, to boil, right? Because you let the pressure off, it gets a little bit warmer. So now it, 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 this, this liquid now boils. Um, and if you send a particle through at the exact same time that this thing starts to, to boil, it'll create ions. So ions, remember, are just like extra electrons on the hydrogen. Um, well, not, maybe not extra, just a, like an uneven amount of electrons. So these ions will boil a few thousandths of a second before the rest of the chamber does. So if they time this picture that they took right here just right, what will happen is you'll actually see a trail where this is all boiling, like these lines here are all boiling um, before the rest of it. So we can actually see them. So it takes a really careful picture for that to happen. Hopefully that makes sense. But if you, so if you really think about it, it's actually just like, um, bubbling in behind the electron or particle, I should say, uh, because it's moving. So it's like causing it to bubble or to boil um, because of how it's moving, right? Okay. Okay. So like it says here, only charged particles and ionizing photons will create tracks in a cloud or bubble chamber. So neither neutral particles nor low energy photons will be detected. So we're going to see that in a second here. So we'll be able to see what we're actually dealing with when we look at these pictures. 
All right, next one. Antiparticles. So like antimatter, right? I've already kind of talked about this. We've talked about the positron. And I've, um, yeah, so we have an electron and the positron pair. Um, so if we go down, what's, what we're going to be dealing with here is something called pair production. And that's going to be making a, an electron and a positron, because they come in a pair, um, out of a photon. So that's what we got going on here. So in pair production, the photon interacts with some nucleus, right? So it smashes into something. I say smash. It's like it's a photon. It wouldn't really smash, I guess. But uh, it hits a, a nucleus of some atom. And the photon all of a sudden just ceases to exist. It just disappears. And it creates a positron and a electron pair, right? So what, just think about that for a second, what just happened there, right? You've got a photon, so like light, like look around like right now and think about the light around you. It will turn into matter. That's really what we got going on here. It's not much matter. It's just like an electron, right? And a, and a positron. But it's like a light wave turning into matter. Like that's weird. So, but that, that is what happens, right? So if we look at this, we can actually see this happening. Um, and if you look, I'm going to use this picture over here because it's cleaned up a little bit. But like it looks like something was traveling this way, right? And then out of nowhere splits into two pieces. And how did I know that thing was traveling that way? Or why didn't I see it over here? Shouldn't I see a trail there? Well, no, because photons aren't going to show up in our cloud chamber. They're not going to, or bubble chamber. They're not going to leave any bubbles behind it because it's a photon, right? So we wouldn't see it. But then all of a sudden, just like seemingly out of nowhere, we get this particle that starts spinning this way. And we get another particle that starts spinning this way. And before you probably start saying, well, how come those things are like two different size circles? That's really just the angle that we're looking at this thing. They would be the same radius, right? The radius of going, this one going this way would be the same as the one going that way. But one of these will be a proton and one of these will be, um, or sorry, a positron and one of these will be an electron. So just take a second to think about which one it would be, right? So if you're using your left hand with a left hand rule, and let's say that we've got a magnetic field that's going into the board, right? Going into the board. Well, can you guys see that if your fingers went into the board and your thumb is in this direction, that the force would be in this direction, like your palm is going that direction? So that would be your electron going this way if the, if the field was going into the board. Now, and it would be the other way around, right? If I use my right hand and have, you know, my thumb going, going this way and my fingers going into the board or paper, then you'll see that the force will be going down. So that's going to be, so this one would be my positron. Okay. All right, moving on. All right, so for an electron-positron pair to, ha to occur, two things must happen. So a photon, like I said before, has to collide with a nucleus. Like it, it won't just happen spontaneously. This thing hits something at this point. Okay. Um... Second, the conservation of mass energy requires that a minimum photon energy must be equal to the rest mass of an electron plus a proton. All right, so what that means is if you're going to create one of these and one of these, this energy has to equal this mass or mass energy equivalence, right? Plus this one. It's got to equal like those two added together, right? I don't know why I drew plus signs like that, but... <laughs> All right. And then this example will be just exactly what I was talking about there. So if you want to, you can pause it and uh, just check that one out and see if you can follow along with what it's saying there. I think it'll be self-explanatory. All right. But if positrons are formed in beta decay in pair production, why are they not normally found in nature? This actually turns out to be like a giant question in cosmology. Um, and not just for this, actually, it turns out like why, where is all the antimatter, right? We're going to get into this in a second with um, where there's, there's antiparticles of every kind, right? Why, when the Big Bang happened, why did we end up with all these normal particles, like we call them, right? And where are all the antiparticles? So, like, where is everything? So that's actually like a, a really big, like, question in cosmology. Um, but anyway, so moving on to this, right? So... 
the positron, like the electron, is a stable particle. So, yeah, it's stable, this positron that's created, right? But there's just so much matter around, right? Like real matter, like electrons everywhere. So the reason why this rogue positron doesn't just like hang out forever is because it pretty quickly will run into some electron. And what happens there is this positron runs into this electron. And I say runs in, they're actually attracted to each other. So they're going to, you know, they both have opposite charges, right? They're going to be attracted to each other. And when they do come back together here, um, we're, it's actually going to make two photons of light. So positron plus electron gives two photons with the equal amount of light. And the reason why it has to be two is because of conservation of momentum, right? If you've got these guys both coming in this way and they smash into each other, well, you've got to end up having one going that way and one going that way for the conservation of momentum to work out. So we end up with two separate photons instead of just one photon, kind of like what we did to begin with, right? We started out with one photon turning into an electron, or sorry, a positron and an electron. But when they come together and annihilate, we end up with two afterward to save the conservation of momentum. Okay, and this is called, I can't remember if I said it or not, this is called pair annihilation when they come together and, and uh, they annihilate each other, right? Turning into just a flash of light. So having discovered electrons and positrons um, and how they can like annihilate each other, it led people to think, well, is there an anti-proton, right? So they started thinking about what's happening there. But in order to, like, we, we could actually make these things, right? We could make these uh, positive electrons just with the, you know, smashing things together. But a proton is 1,840 times as massive as an electron. So the energy required, if I was going to produce an antiproton, would be that. It would be 1,840 times greater. So just looking at cosmic rays coming through our atmosphere to try to produce these things wasn't enough. So this is where we started getting these things called particle accelerators. Um, so it takes lots and lots of energy, right? So to produce these like these heavier particles, right? These anti-protons and, and things of that kind, um, we need about 2,000 giga or that's that's how much accelerators are doing it um, now is 2,000 giga electron volts um or two tera electron volts so there's there's a few famous ones there's the uh particle accelerator at the fermi national accelerator laboratory and then probably the most famous one that you've probably heard about like maybe if you watch big bang theory is the large hadron collider the lhc um, this one's in uh in cern in geneva uh which will operate at 14 tera electron volts I'm not sure if that's the newest number because I know that just recently they did some upgrades and it can go way, it has like uh, way more energy than it used to. I'm pretty sure that's probably the old energy at this point. Okay, nuclear forces. So, so we're gonna get back into explaining. I've brought this question up a few times is, let's say again, I've got helium, right? So I've got two protons and two neutrons. So nuclear forces, we are there. We can start asking, like, what is it that holds these protons, those two protons, together? Because it says up here too, if you imagine these things are only ten to the negative fifteen meters apart, and we can figure this out, right? This is just from using F E is equal to K Q one Q two over R squared, right? We can figure out what this F E is. Um, it ends up being 230 newtons, which is huge. That's more than like, than, you know, like that's around like, you know, if, if you weighed, I don't know, like a hundred pounds or something, that would be equivalent about to like how much force you were pushing down on the earth with, right? So that's a lot. If you're talking about, this is just a, like one or like two protons, right? That's what two protons, the effect that they're having on each other. So that's huge for such a small thing. Um, and this new force that is actually holding these guys together, right? Because they're pushing each other apart. So something's holding them together. This is called the strong nuclear force. And it binds neutrons and protons together in the nuclei. 
it's kind of a strange one. It has an effective range of one times 10 to the negative 15 meters. So it only really works when things are really close and can have energies as much as 100 mega electron volts. So extremely high energy. While the strong force is attractive for this distance, so one times 10 to the negative 15, it actually turns repulsive if you actually go in a little bit. So if, if I try to, so just imagine these two protons, right? So I'm just gonna make them a little bit bigger. So proton and proton. All right, so if they are a certain distance apart, right? So whatever that is, these guys are attractive. So they're gonna be pulling into each other. There's always the electrostatic force pulling out, but the strong nuclear force is stronger, so it pulls in. But if I bring those guys close enough together, weirdly enough, this strong nuclear force just flips right around and it starts pushing back on the other way. So it's like it, it, there's like a sweet spot that it, that it sits in that it wants those things to be exactly at the place that they are pretty much, right? So, yeah, it's kind of strange. If you, if you tried to push them too cl uh, close together, then they, they'll shoot apart again so yeah it's, it's strange how you end up like like you know if you think about gravity you, you, that'd be that'd be as if you know gravity you know you've got this thing and this thing being attracted together and then if you bring them close enough they just like spring off of each other like it'd be it's a very strange force if you think about it like in the macro size all right so this brings us to um the four forces of nature so um, one thing that they really want you to know here, and this is a really big part of physics, is that the gravitational force is extremely, extremely weak compared to all the other forces that we're going to talk about here. So the gravitational force is, you know, you, you guys probably have the most familiarity with that one. That's the thing that's holding you down right now. Um, that's gravity. And we'll skip the weak force for a second. The electromagnetic force is probably everything else that you can think of. So you can think of gravity put, you know, being the thing that's holding you down to the earth. But then you can think about the electromagnetic force as, well, you know, whenever you push on something, so let's say you're pushing on like a block or something here. In the end, that's all electromagnetic force. So what's happening, let's say when I push my hand against the wall right now, I've got particles in my hand that are interacting with the particles in the wall and that's creating a force, but that's really just an electrostatic force, right? And we've talked about how electro, like electrostatic and electromagnetic and other units actually end up being the same from the same thing. So even, you know, if you flex your muscle or like move your arm up and down right now, those interactions that are happening in your, in your muscle, are all electrostatic forces. Everything else is pretty much all electrostatic forces. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it's really only these two. Those are the only ones that we like are familiar with. And then the other two here are the ones we just learned about. And they're like the weak force and the strong force are the forces that are, are inside the nucleus of an atom. They're extremely important. That's what's holding our you know atoms together is the strong force. But we just don't really think about it that often because it's it's only happening at that very small range. So you guys are really responsible for this table, for knowing um, you know the relative strengths, where we find them, and the effective range. You know, just about. So you don't have to have exactly. And then we don't really need to know the mediating particles. That's a bit above us. But and then whether it's been observed or not, well, we don't really need to know that either. Um, we can actually talk about forces as actually being force carrying particles but that's yeah well, I'll, I'll show you where that is that's the next part or the, the end of this lesson there's like a little segment on that um anyway let's talk about though so we've got the strong nuclear force and what it is so that's the force like we said that's holding you know making sure that those protons don't go flying apart right that's the thing holding those together in the nucleus all right so now what is this weak nuclear force this one always confuses me. <laughs> the nuclear nuclear force is really going to be the one that's responsible for uh, nuclear decay. So when we got, and, and mostly, you know, in the last lesson, how we had a neutron. So we had like a neutron, and then it decayed into a proton. And then we had like, you know, an anti-electron or an electron, right, through beta decay. Well, that really is the weak nuclear force. So... 
what it comes down to, let me do it this way. So we've got those two protons again, right? You've got the strong force is holding these guys together. I kind of made that going apart. We've got the str strong force pulling these guys together. Okay. Um, and it is the stronger of the two. And then there's this other weird force that's actually, think about it as like actually inside the proton itself. We're going to talk about this in the next lesson, but that's when we've got like quarks and gluons and there, there's all these other particles we're going to talk about. It'll actually make some of those particles like a quark change into um, like, <laughs> this is going to sound silly, different flavors. We have different flavors of quarks. Um, it'll it'll uh, convert one flavor into another. But really, in the end, what that'll do is change this proton into like a different type of particle, like a neutron. Hopefully that made sense. Um, in the end, if we've got, this is our atom, right? It's like a blown up version. There's our two neutrons. The strong force is binding these things together, keeping them all together. And then the weak force is happening like in between those. So you can think about the weak force is happening like at even smaller distances than uh, than the strong nuclear force so you can see this is happening at 10 to the 15 meters so on the scale of like the atom itself and then the weak force is happening like inside those protons and inside those neutrons and it'll change let's say a proton into a neutron and that'll start this uh decay this nuclear decay from that or uh, the process of nuclear decay all right we don't talk much about weak nuclear force in this unit so we should be we should be okay. It is it is uh, uh, yeah pretty tough concept. Okay, so now fields and particle interaction. So this part is um, optional, but I find it really interesting. I'm not going to go over it just for the sake of time here, but I do um, I do think you guys should read it. I think it's it's interesting and it kind of gives you a better idea like on what's happening here. So so look through this. There's Richard Feynman. He's one of my one of my heroes I think he like they're actually like the good thing about Richard Feynman he was such a brilliant guy and there's still video of him so you can actually watch some videos of some of his lectures and he makes so much sense and he's so clear with his thinking so I encourage you guys go find some videos of Richard Feynman and just listen to some of the really wise things that that he has to talk about all right still optional this with our families as well, like different families, this part we will be getting into a little bit in the next lesson. But for now, you could just kind of look over that and kind of get um, used to it. Okay, so let's do the practice problems. So number one, I'm just going to talk about these ones. Um, so why is it difficult to detect a neutrino? Well, neutrinos just really don't interact with anything, right? So they're, they, they don't make bubbles like like in this picture like in a cloud chamber or in a bubble chamber um and they just don't even interact with anything we do they just pass right through everything that that um that you try to actually detect it with so um it becomes incredibly difficult to actually uh track these neutrinos down okay uh number two determine the type of charge on each particle moving through the magnetic field in this diagram what information would you need to determine which particle is moving faster all right, so this is really a hand rule thing, right? So if you can, fingers into the into the page, and it's moving, let's do the top one, it's moving this way. Okay, so if I'm using my right hand, that would give me an arc this way, right? That'd be the force moving in. So we've got circular motion happening that way. So that would be our positive one because we used our right hand. And then using our left hand, positive, we would get uh, this one, which would be negative, right? Okay, so then what information would you need to determine which particle is moving faster? All right, so in order to see that, you can see that, you know, we're going to know by the arc this thing takes. So if we want to know which one is moving faster, well, w this is one of those equation questions where we can look to the equation to see what it is that's going to affect it. So what I mean by that is, we, okay, like, let's look at this one. If we wanted to know whether this thing was moving fast or not, or what things would affect, let's say, the radius of this guy. Well, the things that would affect this would be, well, let's set it up as FC. 
is equal to Fm, right? Because that's what's we've done questions like that, right? So Fc is going to be equal to mv squared over r, and Fm is equal to qvb for the yeah okay. One of the speeds cancels with the other speed, and if I just rearrange this for for speed, then this would be oh sorry I cancel that q v b over m okay so if i wanted to know which particle is moving faster these are the things that are going to affect that right so it might be it's it's dependent on what charge the particle had it's dependent on oh sorry there's none of either oh that should be an r sorry my bad r so r goes up yeah it's going to depend on the radius of this guy that one's kind of in, uh makes sense right that let's say if we had one that was like a really big radius like this then it's probably going to be moving faster, right? Then if it's something had like a quick little radius like, you know, that or something and turned right around. Um, it's going to depend, depend on the magnetic field that we're using. And it's going to depend on the mass of the particle for the, you know, the momentum is, is really what that is. So, all right. Oh, what happened? Okay. So, number three. Uh, the tracks in this diagram show the creation of two particles in a bubble chamber. Initially, the two particles have the same speed. All right. Um, what evidence suggests that a photon created the two particles? All right, so really what's happening here is this thing just came out of nowhere, right? It's split into two things out of, like, nothing. And the fact that there's nothing over here, right? This wasn't a particle that we could have tracked and then watched it, like, decay into two different things. We've got nothing, and then we've got something. So this really seems like there was this was a photon that ended up turning into a positron and an electron pair because they swirl different directions, right? Okay, describe the path of this uh, photon. I've kind of already done that. Um, it's going to be before, right? The path of the photon would have been leading up right to this point there. Which of the tracks shows the path of a, of a positively charged particle? So a positively charged particle, we want to do hand rules. Remember that the dots mean your fingers are coming out of the page for the magnetic field, right? That's what a dot is. So your fingers are coming out. You're using your right hand. Your thumb is pointed this way. And your palm, if you're doing that, should be down, right? So this would be the positive particle. So probably this was a, a positron. Okay, give two reasons why the other track must show the path of a negatively charged particle. Well, one is going to be that it's going, like, if you use your left hand, you would get the same thing, right? Your fingers, your thumb points, or your fingers out of the board, right? Your fingers are coming, like, out of the page for the magnetic field. Your thumb is pointing that way, and then your palm would be going in, so that would make it, well, that was terrible. It would make it curl around that way, so that would be negative. And then the other thing, though, is just because the th like we know that this was a photon that started this whole thing, a photon is neutral. So if this created a positive particle, then this has to be a negative particle, right? Positive plus negative would give us zero at the at the beginning. Okay, how are the mass and the charge of the two particles related? Well, these are this would be like an electron and a positron, right? So they would be the same mass and they would have just opposite charges. Why is it likely that the interaction involves an antiparticle? Well, this is kind of, again, it came out of nothing. So if we ended up with one being positive and the other being negative, um, this makes sense that they would be a uh, positive and negative antiparticle pair, right? Okay, find the energy equivalent of the mass of a neutron. Okay, so this is just going to be a E is equal to mc squared question because we, we will know the mass of a of a neutron so we've got E is equal to and the mass of a neutron is I'm going to use the long one 1.5 oh sorry nope that's wrong 1.674927 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms times 3 times 10 to the 8 
meters per second squared, and that's all squared. So E is equal to 1.5074343 times 10 to the negative 10 joules. Okay, so that really would be the answer there, but uh, we'll put that into um, electron volts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide that by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per electron volt. And in the end, you end up with 942.1464. And then I've just already changed it into mega electron volts. So times 10 to the 6, right, for mega, so I just moved the decimal place over six times. And that'd be it. Okay, so make sure that you guys do the, uh, the hand-in assignments, and we've only got one more lesson. Okay, see you in class.